Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Equip You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And we have a returning guest today, my dear friend and our brother in Christ, um, Andy Davis. Andy, welcome back to the Equip You and Grace podcast, brother. And Dave, it's so wonderful to join you. I look forward to our conversation. Me too, brother. It's always good to chat with you. Uh, can you just uh, catch us up on what's been going on in your life, marriage, ministry, and any ministry projects you're working on? I, I just looked it up. Uh, we were just chatting about this. Uh, yeah. We haven't uh, had you on since November of 2021. That's a little bit of time. Well, uh, for me personally, uh, 2023 was a pretty eventful year. Um, I passed my 25th anniversary at First Baptist Durham, and the church was just very gracious in celebrating that with my wife and I. And uh, just giving thanks for the ministry of the Word of God over those 25 years. And it's just amazing uh, how quickly the time has passed, but also to see the fruit in our church. And um, just there's no church I would rather lead, pastor, be part of than this church. And I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for the, for God bringing me here 25 years ago and for those years. Also, my wife and I, are, our youngest daughter, uh, graduated from our homeschool in May and is now matriculated at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and so we're empty nesters, which is a pretty big um, um, stage. My wife did a phenomenal job homeschooling five kids, um, you know, 60 kid years, you know, five times 12, just walking through each of those kids uh, years and, and subjects, science and math and literature and history. So she's just an amazing woman. And uh, it's, it's a different time of life for my wife and I. And just in terms of our church, we're strategically located in one of the fastest growing parts in America. It's a high tech area. Um, a lot of companies coming in. Apple's building uh, near us. Uh, Google uh, Fiber Optics is here. And it's estimated that Durham's going to double in size in the next 25 years. And so uh, there need to be a lot of healthy churches in this area. And we hope to be one of them. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll definitely be uh, praying uh, to that end with you for the Lord to raise up biblically qualified men to lead those churches and to send people who, you know, love the Lord and love the word to uh, join uh, on God's mission there in Durham and in, in the broader area. So, well, hey, brother, can you tell us about this new book? It, it's going to come out here soon. Mm -hmm. How to Memorize Scripture for Life from One Verse to Entire Books. Uh, tell us why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received, please. Yeah. So Crossway's publishing it. That's the first book I published with Crossway. And they're a publisher that I have esteemed for many years. I'm grateful for uh, many of their offerings and their authors. I know many of their author authors personally. Um, and so it's exciting for me to be able to partner with them. Um, the foundation of the book was a booklet I wrote a number of years ago um, in a discipleship relationship. I was with uh, a young man, and he wanted to know how I memorized scripture. And so I explained it verbally to so many people. Um, but I thought, tell you what, uh, I'm going to meet with him in a number of hours. Let me just write it down. And what's amazing is I never really edited it after that. I just wrote down the pamphlet, and then it ended up being published by Ambassador, who published my book, Infinite Journey, and it got put on uh, Amazon and sold for 99 cents. And it got downloaded 50, 000, over 50,000 times over the years that followed. And so I think it caught the attention of a good number of people, including Crossway and the acquisition editorial team at Crossway said, you know, we really think scripture memorization is going to be a major part of the American evangelical lands landscape. And they thought that I had a voice in that topic. And um, and so uh, we took the existing pamphlet and edited it, streamlined it, um, made it you know a little sharper, and it's coming out in two weeks. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, and just 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 uh, for everybody, uh, this this will uh, have come out uh, maybe a few days. It'll, this episode will come out January 17th. We're talking a few weeks before that. Uh, okay. Just so everybody knows, you know, brother, you're you're you know you're you're well known for for this idea. You know, you have memorized vast quantities of, of scripture. 
you know, uh, you're, you're known by a lot of people uh, for that. Why did you start extended scripture memorization? How has it impacted your own faith and ministry? I can hardly put it into words. I can hardly put into words what extended memorization of scripture has done for me. Um, just simply, I am a preacher of the word of God. I'm a sequential expositor. And the habit of storing up whole books of the Bible long before I would preach on them and allowing them to marinate in my mind uh, to do um, meditation on passage after passage and, and to have deeper, more interconnected thoughts about the entire book and then to present it in the sermons that then flowed from that. It's hard to put into words what that's meant for me, but that's just me in my calling uh, my spiritual gift ministry. Uh, it's even more significant in my private life, my personal walk with Christ, my fellowship with him, my intimacy with him, a sense of his majesty and greatness, and a deepening and a, and a, a broadening of my love for him, and a sense uh, that I will never fully know everything there is to know about Christ, because the word of God uh, which is just a dim reflection of his infinite majesty and glory. You know, Paul says, you know, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now we know in part, then we'll know fully. And he's talking about scripture. He's talking about prophecy there in 1 Corinthians 13. And so what we know is a tiny fraction of what we will know when we get to heaven and when we are educated uh, fully in the glory of God. And so uh, that moment by moment fellowship, that intimacy with Christ uh, has been strengthened. Plus, there's the battle. I battle just like you do, Dave, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every day I'm at war. Every day, every Christian is at war with sin. And um, storing up scripture has given me an arsenal uh, that has enabled me to slay my sins and to starve them and to keep them subdued, though not as much as I would like. Um, I still grieve over the way that sin gains the upper hand on me, how sin deceives us and takes advantage of uh, uh, takes advantage of us and comes at us in our weak moments, just like Jesus when he had been fasting for forty days, and Satan comes when we're weak. Um, but still, Scripture is an arsenal of of powerful weaponry. Also, it's a it's a toolbox for me in terms of counseling as I do cure of souls. I meet with people that are struggling in their marriage or their personal lives. And and the Holy Spirit just uses verses that I've been meditating on and they just flow from me like water. It's a beautiful thing. As Jesus said in John 7, um, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. I think a pastor should be like that, a, a fountain of living water uh, flowing from Christ and from Scripture. And when you have it stored up in your mind and it's ener energetically active in your mind and you're thinking about it, you open your mouth and it just flows out. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Now, you asked how I got into it. Um, you know, years and years ago, I, I came to faith in Christ my junior year at MIT. I came from a Roman Catholic background and I had a good experience in the Catholic Church. I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't experience anything uh, immoral or, you know, there was that terrible abuse scandal. I'd never experienced any of that. Um, I learned accurately about Jesus and about the Trinity, but I did not learn accurately about the gospel and about salvation from the Roman Catholic Church. When I got to MIT, um, a fraternity brother led me to faith in Christ, uh, and I went to a retreat with Campus Crusade for Christ and and got involved in that movement, and I was mentored uh, by a wonderful man um, last um, half of my junior year and then all of my senior year at MIT. And he was big into um, the topical memory system. The navigators uh, had something called the topical memory system. And that was um, individual verses on flashcards. And uh, they had titles on them, like Christ the Center or New Life in Christ, something like that. And then the reference, and then you'd memorize the verse. And um, some of the veteran memorizers in the movement at MIT had several hundred of these cards on these snap rings, you know, like janitor key, keys, you know, and they would just crank through these cards and um, they were way ahead of me. So I memorized 20 or 30 verses um, and just was into the habit of doing topical verses. Um, but once I graduated and uh, got into my engineering career. Uh, I didn't continue with the with the practice uh, until I went to 
uh, uh, Kenya on a mission trip. And I remember this, it was summer of 86. And I had my whole Bible with me, a pocket Bible, small Bible. Um, and I was waiting for a bus to Nairobi. And uh, I'll never forget that. And and I had hours to wait because things just come on a different schedule there in Africa. And so I was just sitting there and I started memorizing the book of Ephesians. And I just worked on it that summer. It was a 10-week mission trip. And that changed my life. Um, when I came back to uh, America, I continued the, the habit. I was in maybe chapter two or chapter three. And I, I worked until I finished Ephesians. And then I added another short epistle, uh, Philippians. And then I felt led by God to take a deep breath and go after a big, a big one. And that was the gospel of Matthew, 1,068 verses. And I upped my pace uh, to six verses a day. And I just cranked through the gospel of Matthew um, over that next year. And that started my basically my career of doing extended memorization of scripture. And I've added book after book since then. I don't, please understand, I don't retain the books. I don't try to retain them. I, I, I believe in what I say, kiss, kiss the book goodbye. You know, when that, when I've said the, when I've said the section of scripture for 100 consecutive days, I don't recite it anymore. And then I forget it. But I do believe it's subterranean, like in my subconscious, a lot of it's still in there. And some parts I can still recite very well. Um, so that's it. It's just a lifetime project of taking on new books and memorizing them. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really good. I, I as you're talking, I remembered uh, a story that I think John Piper writes about, and I think it was either a blog post or maybe it was a sermon. I, I di- can't remember, but I remember when he was he talks about how when he started pastoring, he realized very quickly that uh, he needed to engage in this practice because, you know, when you go to the hospital and such, you have to have something to to say that's you know, helpful and edifying to the person that's, you know, that's in the hospital. And, and so, uh, you know, that, that's an encouragement, I think, for, for all of us. Um, you know, uh, Jim Neuheiser is the uh, executive director of the Institute of Biblical Counseling and Care. And, and one time we were talking uh, on the show, and he said, you know, uh, how much of God's word can you, to, to our listeners, how much of God's word can you access? And it's kind of the same, same similar idea to what you're, you're talking about. How much of the word of God as you face your own trials and situations and difficulties and, and then as you minister the word wherever, you know, the Lord and his providence has placed you, how much of God's word can, can you access in that moment, in that time, you know, and, uh, and, and, it, and it's not even just in a moment, like, like we're in a moment right now, you know, we're, we're, we have, I have some questions prepared, but everything else is just off the cuff, you know? So it's, it's whatever, whatever, what do you have? What do you have at your disposal? You're in your toolkit in that moment, in that conversation, uh, to, to really minister and speak to, to the person. I, I think it's a, it's a convicting question, and it and it's a convicting question for not just the new Christian. It's a convicting question if you've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, it, it's a challenge for all of us. So, yeah. Absolutely. You know, and we're not done being saved. We, uh, we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Um, we're in process. Sanctification goes on day after day, and the Word of God is essential to that. You know, so what happened was— um, uh, for 15 months or more, I don't remember the exact span, span of time, I worked on the book of Ezekiel. It was the hardest book I've ever memorized. Very, very difficult. Um, and I'm older now. I'm, you know, I'm 61. My mind is not as sharp as it used to be. You know, I think it's absolutely true that you think about an athlete and their reflexes aren't quite what they were when they were 22. Um, their speed isn't quite the same. You know, they know more of the game, uh, but they just can't physically get where they want to get. And then at some point they retire. I think the same thing happens with your mind. I think, you know, we're, we're at our best at a peak, you know, and I, I'm not saying that I can't still memorize or, or still remember. I can, but it's just a very hard book. Um, and visionary, uh, prophetic genre is, I think, the hardest to memorize because it's nonlinear. It doesn't every chapter. It, it, you just never quite sure what the Spirit's going to lead Ezekiel to write about next. Um, and so it's very difficult 
to follow the logical sequence A to B to C to D E. It doesn't work that way. And so it was very, very difficult. And when I got done with my last section, 100 days, finished Ezekiel, 48 chapters, um, I was pretty beaten down at that point. I was like, I don't even know that I can still memorize. You know, I've been so hard. And so I wanted to see if I could get Romans back and if it was still there. And, you know, to God be the glory, I got Romans recitable at a 90 to 95 percent accuracy within three or four weeks, which was amazing. It was so refreshing, Dave. It was like, wow, this is very familiar and it's flowing like water through a pipe. And I'm still learning new things from Romans. So I'm now, I think in this phase of my life, the last book I have to memorize in the New Testament is Luke. So that's my bucket list. That's that's my 27th New Testament book. And then the New Testament will be checked, done. Um, so that's my next book. That'll be 2024. But I'm almost able to recite all 16 chapters of Romans pretty close to flawlessly. And it's not hard for me. And I think what I want to do is I want to recite it once a week, probably indefinitely, because I'm learning so much. Let me give you an example. Romans 14, Paul's talking about de debatable issues, meat sacrifice to idols, sacred days. Um, and one of the principles he gives that kind of eluded me, I hadn't really noticed it with this clarity, is Paul speaks very positively about the way people should go about these controversial topics. He says, the, the man who considers one day as sacred does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord and gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Well, that was that spoke so powerfully to me, not about controversial topics, but about a Christ-centeredness that I didn't really think characterized my life. I wasn't doing everything I did to the Lord. I wasn't a slave of Christ's. You know, I was uh, more like a free agent doing what I wanted to do with my time. And those verses in Romans 14 just absolutely convicted me and nailed me. And now I want to see what God will do with it. But it's like, I want to be more Christ-centered and servant-oriented in my mind than ever before. And why? Because I'm going over Romans 14 every day. And that's what, that's what did it. So it's just the power of the Word of God to transform us, Dave. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, that's that's really good, brother. Well, what are some of the main hindrances that that people have to memorizing scripture in general and large chunks of the Bible in particular? Well, I've said for many years, the number one enemy of memorization is giving up. People just give up, you know, but then maybe the question you're asking is, well, yeah, but why do they give up? Well, they give up because it's hard. They give up because they lack the discipline to get into the daily habit. And when you do it for two days and then don't do it for three days and then you do it for one day and don't do it for four days. Well, guess what? It's not going to stick very well. So you have to say, all right, look, I'm, I'm in, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to miss any days. You know, I'm just going to go at this. And I think it's okay to have a day off once a week, but you're just going to, you're going to do it. You're going to come at it and come at it and come at it and, and you just don't give up. And so I think I think what it is, is people uh, people lack discipline. Uh, I think we all struggle with that to some degree. Um, people also, uh, you know, before they even really try, they think they can't do it. Um, it's not necessarily helpful for me to say to them that I memorized uh, Ezekiel. That just makes no sense. It's like jumping over a moon, the moon. Uh, they like to memorize John 3.16. You know, they like to memorize four or five verses that will help them in their prayer life. They don't want to do 48 chapters, almost 1,200 verses of a visionary prophet. So that's just, you know, that's could be more discouraging than anything. So I think people, they, they're they discouraged uh, before they even start. They think they don't have a good memory. Um, they lack the desire. They lack the interest in it. Um, so there's a number of obstacles people have to get over. But here's the thing. If people get into it, they immerse themselves in it. And they give themselves to the discipline and they don't miss days and they recite, recite, recite. They just, and that's what memorization is. It's simple. It's repetition over time. Just repeat it over time. 
Just keep repeating it. Say it, say it, and say it day after day after day, and you'll get it. And then uh, as you as you do that, you're going to get the real benefit. And the real benefit is insight. That's always, that's what you're looking for. The, the, the benefit is insight. Or as you said a few moments ago, I really like that, immediacy. The ability to call to your mouth, to your mind and to your mouth, the word when you need it. But, but the real joy is insight, some new thing you had not seen before. And when that starts happening, you won't be discouraged anymore about the labor. You're like, yeah, it's hard work, but it's worth it. And so I've had many, many people come back to me and say with emotion how grateful they are for the time that they spend on memorizing Ephesians or Philippians or some book. They have gotten so much out of it. So they're they're hooked now. That's I'm advocating, Dave, a lifetime of memorizing, memorizing for your whole life. That's why the book says how to memorize scripture for your, for life. This is a lifetime habit, not just a, a one-off trying to achieve Philippians or something like that. And I, and I like how you're even, I, I agree. And, and I like how you're even, you know, framing this whole conversation. It took you some, some days and you up your pace after you were experience, more experienced. So, you know, it's not just like, okay, can you memorize for a guy? Can you memorize a sports fact? And we're not guilt tripping anybody when I say that, but if you can memorize a, a, a sports fact or, or any fact or any kind of information, we all can. You can take the time over an extended period of time, however many days that is, and you can memorize a verse or verses or an entire book, even if it takes you however long it takes you. You know, you know. I, I think sometimes, as with a lot of these things, it's it's how we it's how we position it. You know, it's how we uh, put it forward to to people, and sometimes we we do make it. We have to be honest. Um, as authors, as communicators, we can make it. Th th here's here's how here's how I do it. We we should s say that, but we should also say, you know, this is what's worked for me, and here's the principles behind it. And it's the principles behind it that I don't know if if we do as well. I'm not saying you don't. I'm just saying when we talk about like spiritual disciplines, Bible reading, etc., and these types of topics, I just I get a little get a little concerned for you know, the average person in the pew that they hear that and then they try it and they, they give up because they don't really understand the principles. And so all they hear is, here's how I did it. I do. So they do it and then they fail, but they, they don't understand the principles. If, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And I think ultimately what ends up happening, if you got somebody who's genuinely born again, they're indwelt with the Holy spirit. Um, the word of God is going to come in with that fruitfulness that Psalm one talks about. It's going, they'll be like tree planted by streams of water, which yield fruit in season and just leaf never withers. And then this beautiful statement, whatever he does prospers. And this is not a prosperity gospel teaching. It's just right in the Bible. It's Psalm one. God is going to bless you richly and fully and comprehensively. If you'll give yourself to his word daily, if you'll immerse your mind in it. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your marriage will be better. Your parenting will be better. Your stewardship, the way you, you deal with your money, your health will be better. God is going to bless, bless, bless you because that's what God's word is. Primes the pump for everything in, in the Christian life. Everything comes from knowing God's word. And, and conversely, so much trouble comes from ignorance of God's word. It's devastating uh, when people are in the dark and don't know God's word. Yeah, uh, maybe you can speak to that. W what are some of the results of a general ignorance of the Word of God in the church today? Yeah, it's terrible. I think there's a whole book devoted to it in the Bible, and that's the book of Judges. There's a lot of there's a lot of themes in Judges, but Judges is a horrible book. It's just absolutely scandalous. Um, so you got the Jewish people, the chosen chosen race, and they're just utterly pagan. They're just like a pagan people, and focal uh, the focal point of the book. It's well known. In those days, Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But it's not just the king, the lack of a king. It's the Levites. The Levites, the priests, the priestly caste or class, it was their role to teach the people the law of God. No generation is ever born knowing God's law. No baby is born into the world knowing special revelation, knowing the Bible. None of them. They have to be taught. And so look what happens in that book. By the end of the book, 
they are like they're almost literally like Sodom and Gomorrah, overtly wicked, immoral, and disgusting. And there's this one Levite who goes around, you know, hiring himself out as a personal like chaplain to this person or to the highest bidder. And it's just, it's scandalous. And so it's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And look what happens. Look what happens. And it's just so bad how the Benjamites are almost going to be eradicated because no one would marry them. It's just this messed up, wicked situation. And I think its role in the 66 books of the Bible and the canon is many things, but it's a cautionary tale to say, this is what it looks like when people are ignorant of the word of God. This is what ends up happening. They live lives of darkness, of immorality and wickedness. All right, so then you look at our culture. Our culture is becoming increasingly pagan, increasingly anti-Christian. And we've got whole generations of kids that are born in unbelieving homes that literally know nothing about the Bible. It's like like they're, you know, in Papua New Guinea or or some in sub-Saharan Africa before David Livingston and some of the missionaries. They they know nothing. And so we actually um we did an uh, a ministry at Christmas a number of years ago, and I was taking a, a seven-year-old back to his home uh, near our church, and uh I was talking about the basic facts of Christmas and about Mary and Joseph. He knew literally none of it. He'd never heard the name Jesus before. He was seven years old. But I thought, you know, no one is born knowing Jesus's name. No one is born knowing anything uh, about spiritual things, special revelation. And so what ends up happening is if people don't know the word of God, they're going to go back to their own instincts, their own animal instincts, their own lusts and drives and desires and pleasures, and they're going to live accordingly. And uh, it's tragic. Now, when you get people converted out of that, if they go to a church that doesn't preach the word carefully and accurately, if they don't rightly divide the word of truth and they don't pour out the word of God on people, including the law, you know, the Ten Commandments, the, you know, the laws of the New Testament. There are many laws in the New Testament, like husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's a law. You know, if they don't faithfully, accurately teach the whole counsel of God's word, they're really only kind of lightly converted. They're converted, but they're only lightly transformed pagans. And so that's why you've got to have a careful unfolding of the whole counsel of God's word from the pulpit. And extended memorization of scripture admirably fits into that calling beautifully, I would say. Amen. (laughs) You know, amen. That's, that's beautifully said. You know, I I was thinking, you know, uh, you know, Ezra, Ezra seven, Ezra seven, 10, uh, Nehemiah eight and nine, you know, the people didn't know the, you know, just to bring that up po- another point, they didn't, they, they didn't know the law. They, they were ignorant. And here Ezra had to teach them, you know, the law. He explained to them, you know, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. He explained to them, you know, what God had done and what was the response just, just to the point that you brought out. They were devastated by their sin. They, they saw, they saw themselves um, as as sinners in need of of the sufficiency of of the Lord, and uh, they they turned from their sin and turned to the Lord and and trust and and faith and you know repentance and faith in Christ. And so um, you know, I mean that that's that's what that kind of preaching does. It it wrecks us in the best possible way, and that's a. Uh, that's a blessing from from the Lord. We we definitely need that uh, yeah. today. Yeah, we're, so we're, this Sunday, I'm yeah. I'm sorry. I'm preaching through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm in Mark 13. So I'm doing eschatology, and I'm just walking through it. I do not consider eschatology to be the most important uh, topic theologically in the Bible, but it is important, very important, and it's important to know where we're heading. And um, uh, I love Matthew 24, 25, and Mark 13, and uh, be able to walk through that. I'm preaching, Dave, an entire sermon, an entire sermon on Mark 13, 14, uh, which is the abomination of desolation. And uh, it's a phrase that I studied carefully when I was memorizing the gospel. I mean, sorry, memorizing the book of Daniel. And, um, you know, I haven't written the introduction of the sermon yet, but I want to zero in on the word desolation and say, you know, I, this is really exciting for me and fascinating um, the word desolation just means emptiness, like a vacuum, like there's nothing there. 
And uh, it specifically refers to God removing himself from the nation of Israel because of their sins, that God isn't there. And it's interesting because the very last word in Ezekiel is the Lord is there. So there's this visionary temple and the God had left the glory of the Lord had left the temple earlier in Ezekiel. But then now the Lord has come back and the Lord is there. The Lord dwells there. So that's what new heaven, new earth is all about. It's about um, being with God, seeing him face to face, being close to him. So Dave, I'm going to talk about, you know, redemptive history. I'm going to talk about what the abomination of desolation means in the book of Daniel. But I want to specifically also talk about people's relationship with God. And the question is, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be filled with God? What does it mean to have a sense of the immediacy and the intimacy and the closeness of having God there? And God says in the scripture, am I only a God far away and not a God? Am I only God nearby and not a God far away? Um, Can anyone hide in secret places so that I will not find him? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Think about that. Do I not fill heaven and earth? So then what is the desolation? It's relational. It's God judging people by acting distant from them, even though in him we live and move and have our being. So this is going to be an exciting sermon, but I'm going to ask a lot of my people, they've got to focus for 40 minutes and trace out this history of how God um, gives over his sanctuary to invading Gentile armies as a judgment on the Jews. And it's it's just going to be a very interesting sermon. And but part of Dave, part of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it is I want people to have an esteem for the Word of God. I want them to see two things. I want them to see simplicity, and I want them to see complexity. I want them to see milk, and I want them to understand meat. I want them to know that the basic truths of the Bible are so so simple and elementary that a, a toddler can understand them. And that the Bible will soar over the greatest intellects and the greatest geniuses that the world has ever seen for their entire life. They will never be able to put it all together. I want them to see both. Amen, brother. Amen. That's really good. Love it. How how is memorization linked to meditation? Well, they're not the same. Uh, I think you can meditate without memorizing. To memorize, if you have memorized something and you've, you've done it right, you can open your mouth and say those those verses, those words, without looking at the Bible. That means you have memorized it. Okay, that's the goal. Um, but the ultimate goal is insight, as I said. Meditation is a discipline whereby you work over the words with, with, uh, with uh, conceptual framework. So you ask, what does this mean? Like I was just doing a second ago with the word desolation. What does the word desolation mean? You know, what is the emptiness that God is talking about here, et cetera? And so trying to understand that. And and so meditation can occur without memorization. But I don't think if you're going to follow my pattern of read it 10 times, say it 10 times, say it 10 times the next day, say it once a day for 100 consecutive days, that's the method that I teach in my booklet. You know, you're going to be uh, meditating. It's impossible to do that methodology without meditating on the words. So meditation is chewing over the truths of of God's word until you get insight, until something comes, a new idea, an aha moment, a eureka moment. You're like, wow, I've never seen that before. That's cool. Something new comes from it. Yeah. Yeah. And as as you're talking, I'm just thinking about the the person who really struggles and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people like you mentioned, they're very, very intelligent, you know, a lot of Christians doing a lot of great things. Um, But but when when even even among those people that are very well educated and in various disciplines and even others that may not be, you know, overly educated, but they have experience, a lot of experience doing a lot of different types of things, a lot of different types of work. Um, you know, what I hear is from a lot of Christians is they really struggle with application. And, and what you just said, it's the answer to that issue. You want to know how to find some application? Uh, take the word 
and meditate. Do exactly what you just said. Uh, take it in, memorize it, take it, take it in, dwell on it, linger on it, chew on it. And, you know, there's even the idea of preaching it to yourself um, there that, that you could make an argument for as well. And, uh, and that's, that's really how you're going to get that application. Like you said, aha, you're going to get some insight. You're going to get some understanding and, um, you know, so it's, it's great that people know, you know, biblical and systematic theology and church history and, you know, all that stuff. Woohoo. I'm a fan of all of it. You know, I love all of it. I, I don't like just part of it. I, I like all of it, man. You know, I do, but, uh, what I what I've come to, especially you know, post seminary, um, you know, now for let's see, twelve years now, I've been out of seminary. Um, it's that it's that application, you know, it's that how am I doing it? Like like Jim Newheiser was saying, uh, how much of God's word can I really access? How much of God's word am I really applying? And that's that's where the rubber meets the road, you know, because if I'm not if I'm not loving my wife and loving my family and loving the church and serving fellow church members or whatever. Um, I could be like Paul said in first Corinthians, I could be a clanging gong, you know, mm -hmm. I could be, I could be utterly um, ineffective and, and useless instrument. So, and that's a, that's a, that's a shocking thought really. I think it's a jarring thought. And uh, you know, f I know for, I know my own heart and I know my own propensities I know where I've come from um, in my own walk with the Lord, and um, I know that I I need it, and I know that I need the reminder. We need we we got to have one another, and we got to take this um, so so seriously um, today if we want to have healthy and vibrant and stable lives in Christ, like you know Scripture tells us, Scripture teaches us. And um, as we see, you know, we, we both love the Reformers and the Puritans. People wonder what was so great about them. They were just doing these, these very things that we're talking about today. You know, they took it seriously and they, they believe the word of God and they sought to apply it. And, you know, I have the highest level of esteem for the way that they did. Well, brother, um, you know, for the person that, you know, they've never... Um, maybe you can speak to the person that, you know, they've never engaged in, you know, memorization. Um, they've never started this process. Uh, what would you say to them about, you know, getting started? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I wrote my original booklet on extended memorization of scripture, and it would be possible to read that, that I was somehow disparaging memorizing topical verses. But you heard from my testimony earlier, that's how I got started. And I think it's a good place for everyone to start. You know, memorize some key verses that will help you in your life. Um, some key verses to help you understand the gospel or help you in prayer. Um, and just, you know, do 10 or 20 of those kind of verses and work on that. And just get in the habit of, of you know, it's again, I've said several times what it is. Um, it's repetition over time. Um, there's nothing magical about the number 10 but I have 10 fingers, so I thought I'll read it 10 times and say it 10 times. And then the next day, I would say it 10 times again. And then I would say the whole thing once a, once a day for 100 consecutive days. That's my method. And so if you do that for some verses, 10 or 20 verses, that are key verses for you, some of your favorites, maybe the Romans Road or uh, something in, you know, maybe John 316 or something else that would help you. Um, and then you, you get some confidence. You think, you know, I actually think I can do this. Then I would suggest the first step on extended memorization, um, I would say would be either, um, a psalm that you like or, um, an epistle. The epistles are very efficient in a short space. You get a lot. So Philippians is 104 verses, uh, Ephesians 155 verses. That's six months at a verse a day, basically. It's definitely doable if you don't give up. Remember, the enemy of Scripture memorization is giving up. Just don't give up. Work at it every day. And you can say, oh, excuse me, the entire book of Ephesians six months from now. What would that be worth to you? Think about that. It's awesome. You know, I think that is, uh, I'll just pick up on that point. You know, I think that is that is gold right there, you know with uh you know taking the time a verse a day over six months so good so good um 
Well, brother, where can people find you on social media or otherwise? Um, I know you have a, a media sure. ministry as well. Can you tell yeah. us about that as well? Yeah, all of my sermons, many of my writings, uh, articles are available in, in twojourneys.org. So www.twojourneys.org, T-W-O-J-O-U-R-N-E-Y-S.org. And um, it's all there. And man, that, that website has just grown and grown and grown and grown in terms of hits. I think it's getting 100,000 hits a month at this point um, because people are hungry for God's word. And the price is right, of course. <laughs> so, you know, sermons, you got whole outlines, you got, you know, pastors love transcripts. All right. Because you don't have to listen to the whole 40 minute sermon. You like you want to zero in on one particular part of Romans. And because I'm a sequential expositor, it's useful to pastors. Um, but people I've I've been told listen to the sermons while they exercise or do different things. So I would commend that website, that ministry. That's um that's the home base for me. That's wonderful, brother. Well, you know, as always, there's so much to talk about, about all of these things, and we've only scratched the surface. Uh, can you just give us a few takeaways as we land the plane on this conversation, brother? Yeah, I would say to all of your hearers that are, or the watchers that are watching this um, this um, session that we're having together, I would I would just say, you know, ask the Lord if this is something that he wants you to do. If you're not involved in extended memorization of Scripture— you know, pray about it. Uh, just we're talking from Romans 14, and uh, you're not your own. You're bought at a price, 1 Corinthians 6. We are slaves of the Lord. We're going to have to give an account um, on Judgment Day for everything we've ever said or done. And I just really believe uh, what Proverbs, sorry, Psalm 1-3 says, you'll be blessed, uh, whatever you do will prosper. If you devote yourself to the Word of God, on His law, He meditates day and night. Um, that implies memorization because back then the Jews didn't all have their own copies of the Word of God. So they had to memorize it if they're going to meditate on it day and night. And so I would just say, roll up your sleeves, having prayed, say, Lord, I really do believe you want me to memorize something, and then get started. And we talked a few minutes ago about how to start. But if you do, you will not regret it. I guarantee if there comes a point sometime in the future, six months or a year from now, where you can recite an epistle like Philippians or Colossians or Ephesians, the whole thing from memory, 90, 95% accurately, you will not say that was a waste of time. I wish I'd never done it. I, get, I pretty much guarantee that you will not say that. Instead, you'll say, I can't wait to do my next book. Absolutely, brother. That's really good. Well, well guys, uh, we've been talking today with my friend and our brother in Christ, Andy Davis, about his book, How to Memorize Scripture for Life. From one verse to entire books, I promise you that if you read this book, it will help you. It, it will help you to learn to memorize scripture. It'll help you to learn um, the importance of memorizing scripture. And so, uh, this is just a this conversation is really just a taste of that. And but but here's the other thing: as as a, you've no doubt picked up on, you know, uh, <laughs> Andy hasn't just written about this as a you know, a theoretical exercise. This has been something that he's been engaged in for a long, long time. And so uh, you're going to learn from a practitioner and somebody who really knows how to do this. So I want to encourage you to to pick up this book from my friend and brother, and uh, you'll be blessed. So thank you, brother, for your time and, and for your ministry. And may God continue to bless you and use you as an instrument of his word. I feel the same for you. Thank you, Dave, for letting me come on and for the time we've had together. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.